It's great to be here. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is robots. <coughs> robots have just been in industrial applications, but there's now a huge amount of investment in robots and artificial intelligence. And this is meaning that robots are moving out of those kind of environments. And we're seeing in, in robots in all kinds of uh, uh, environments uh, in, in, in human activity. So you can see them robots in agriculture, so in farming. You can see robots in transportation. You can encounter a robot uh, in, in a shop. You can uh, buy a robot for your home. And you can buy a robot for your child to play with. Robots are coming. So my question really, and what I'm interested in, is how do we understand robots when we interact with them? When we just encounter them? How do we make sense of them? How can we calibrate our trust towards them? How can we understand when we just encounter a robot what it's doing, what its purpose is, what it's going to do next, um, what kind of capabilities does it have? So how do we understand uh, robots and autonomous machines when we interact with them? Well, in order to answer that question, we have to understand a little bit about humans, how humans work, and a little bit about how um, evolution has evolved us to be the way we are. Since life got started on our planet, all living organisms, whether that's bacteria, plants or animals, have sensed the world and they've sensed their internal state. And they use this information to make choices. So for example, even a tree will shed branches. If that tree's in a forest, it can shed branches if the leaves on that tree and not getting enough light. And it will grow branches up towards the light. So that's intelligent behaviour. And that's the kind of broad definition of intelligence that computer scientists like me would, would try and use when we understand machines. As animals came along, they, they evolved to actively sense the world. So they keep an eye out for food, for predators, and for possible mating opportunities. So it's really important for animals to, to mate because they need to get their genes into the next generation. And over time, those genes um, change the behavior of the animal as they evolve. Animals started to manipulate one another, another by sending signs and signals to each other. Uh, so for example, uh, these vultures, you can see the vulture at the bottom there flapping his wings. So he's signaling to those other vultures, maybe attracting a mate or maybe trying to scare them off. A lion will roar. When a lion roars in the forest, it's making a statement. It's trying to manipulate the minds of the other animals in the forest to say it's dominant, it's in charge, it's the lion. This anglerfish is even more sophisticated. So you can see here the bony protrusion on the front of the anglerfish. Okay, so it's a lure. It lures the prey in. So the, the prey, is, it thinks that's, that's some food that the prey can eat, and when it gets, comes towards it, the anglerfish eats it. So this is manipulation, communication as manipulation. And of course, um, what's, what's really important to understand is that the prey is not just going to continue to be manipulated. The prey becomes smarter, so it evolves to understand when it's being manipulated. Now, we, we humans, we're hypersocial animals, okay? And we, um, we hypersocial animals have huge brains. And the, the main reason that we have these large brains is so that we can understand the interactions with one another. We can, we can make models in our minds of how we interact with one another. And we have a one really unique ability as humans, and that's language. So although animals can make signs and signals and make certain kinds of communication with one another, we humans have this much more evolved system called language. So for example, I can manipulate your, uh, your mind and place something into your mind just by saying a few short words. Just imagine, if you will, a warm summer's day by the beach. 
Could you do that? Okay. So I don't know exactly what you're imagining, but I'm sure you're imagining the smell of the sea, the warm breeze on your face, the sun on your face, the sound of children playing. You're imagining all kinds of really quite complicated things that go together to make up this image. I manipulated your mind into doing that just by saying some sound with my mouth. And the cost of that for me was incredibly small. However, if I'm going to manipulate you to your detriment, then you're not necessarily going to believe me. So if I say to you guys, hey, give me a hundred pounds now, I'm Rob Wood, I'm a really honest guy, I'll give you a thousand pounds back next week. Anybody going to do that? No, you're not going to be that easily, easily manipulated. However, <laughs> if I tell you something that you really want to hear, and I'm perceived as a person of authority, then it's likely that you're going to believe me. Or at least some of you are going to believe me, right? Maybe 52% of you will believe one side of the story, and 48% will believe the other side of the story. That, yeah. So, um, so just think about that for a minute. So why don't we all lie to each other all the time? Okay, so we have this, uh, we have this mechanism. It's called reputation. If I lie and you catch me lying, then you'll tell your social network. That's called gossip. Now the result of that <laughs> is that your social status will go up and my social status will go down. Now your social status is actually held in my mind. And my social status is held in your mind. So we have a theory of mind of each other. And that theory of mind is incredibly complex in us hypersocial animals. It's the way we understand each other. It's the way that we have been able to work together in society. But that model is the way that we understand many, many things. We do a thing called anthropomorphizing, which is that we understand things around us as if they were people. So that might be animals, your pets. You treat them kind of as if they're people. We do the same thing with inanimate objects. My car just it doesn't like me today. It doesn't want to start. Okay, my computer, you know, it's crashed and it's, 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 it's destroyed all my files. Okay, so it's becoming an active agent. So these machines and inanimate objects around us, we see agency in them. We humans are also good at one other really, really good thing, which is that we make tools. Lots of animals make tools, but we make really, really sophisticated tools. And starting 250 years ago with the Industrial Revolution, we started to make tools that mean that we don't have to do some of the things that we used to do by hand. We've now got machines to do these things. More recently, we started to build incredible machines that allow us to do things that we could never do before. So we could never go out into space before. Now we can do that. And many, many other things that we just couldn't do before we can now do. But until really very recently, all of those machines were controlled by us humans. Okay, they were like tools, sophisticated tools, but we controlled them. We switched them on, we switched them off, we pressed all the buttons, we controlled everything. Now that's changing, and it's changing fast with the rapid advances in artificial intelligence. So today, we have these things. These are intelligent, autonomous machines. You'll all know that they're called robots, right? Now these things are not science fiction. These are all products you can buy any of these robots here. And these, these machines can interact with us in a variety of ways. So they can sense us, they, they have vision, they can make sense of our language to some degree, they can um, measure our emotional state. So that robot on the right there can respond to you apparently appropriately to your emotional state. And just think about that for a minute. How are we going to understand these machines? How are we going to interact with them? We're going to use our theory of mind. The theory of mind that we, that we gained over evolutionary time that we still share with our hunter-gatherer ancestors. That's the only real model we have in our, head, in our heads to understand them. 
So that was my hypothesis, and we wanted to test that hypothesis. So I built this machine, this little robot. I call it R5. It's a really simple little machine. It's Arduino-based, and if you know about Arduino, it's an Arduino-based machine. And it can do uh, some basic stuff. So it can navigate around without bumping into things. It has a heat sensor on the front, and it can detect humans. And when it goes up to a human, it then sort of goes through a process of detecting whether that's a human or not. And if it, if it detects a human, it flashes a green light. And if it can't, it flashes a red light. And then it goes off and just sees if it can find some more humans. And we did some experiments with this machine uh, in various locations. And we did some online experiments as well with this machine to see what people make of it when they just observe it. They just encounter it. We give them no social clues about, or, or any kind of clues about what's going on. And we find that people come up with all kinds of crazy ideas about the capacity of the machine, what it's doing, how intelligent it is, what its objectives are, what it means when the lights flash, what does, what does it mean when it stays still. People have really poor model in their mind of that machine. That's a really big problem. Now, this machine looks armless. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that was a bit risky, but yeah, this machine, this machine looks army, armless. But I mean, it's got a kind of smiley face painted on the front of it. But do we know what it's doing? Do you know what that machine's doing there? What's it doing? It's kind of small thing looking up, moving around. I mean, it could just be really helpful. You know, it could be a really helpful machine that uh, wants to direct us, you know, where, wherever we want to go. But it could have an internet connected camera. It could be streaming that information remotely, all the video that's, that it's gathering, to who knows where, for what purpose. Uh, it could be recording the audio. It could be trying to take us off to somewhere. You know, it could be anything could be going on with it, really. We, we don't really know. It's, uh, it's an opaque machine. It's not transparent. It's not really telling us anything about itself or what its intended purpose is. So I've been doing some experiments where we're looking at how we can improve the little R5 robot that you saw earlier to try and make it more transparent. So in this first experiment here, on the right-hand side, you can see there's a video there of me interacting with the robot. And on the left-hand side, there's this display. And this is a very simple graphical representation of what's going on inside the mind of the robot, okay, inside the action selection system that's making the decisions about how the robot does the things that it does. And we showed this to people uh, online and then asked them the questionnaire and we looked for the difference in their understanding, how good is their mental model understanding when we have, have this transparency display as opposed to just letting them just observe the robot directly. And we see what scientists call a very significant difference, okay? a significant improvement in the understanding of, of, of the robot. But actually, interestingly, people don't think that they understand it any better. If you ask the people in those two groups, do you understand the robot, you get pretty much the same answer. So they think that they understand the robot, but this transparency display is really beneficial in helping them actually understand what the robot's doing. In the most recent experiment we, we've just completed, um, we've done something slightly different. So rather than having a graphical presentation, of the, of the processes that's going on inside the machine's brain as it runs. We have this um, sound. So it produces kind of sentences. So what's happening is we have a kind of window into the side of the machine's brain, and we take out the processing, and we use that to generate sentences. So it's not a behavior of the machine itself. It's kind of a window into the mind of the machine. And the reason those guys have got headphones on is because there's a lot of noise this is at the Bristol Science Learning Centre, and there's a lot of background noise, so we just use some Bluetooth, and then they can, they can hear, the, hear the robot clearly. And we get a similar significant difference in improvement of the robot. So we're just demonstrating, A, how people don't understand robots, and B, how we can make those machines much more transparent, which is really important. Now, these guys, these guys are all robot designers. All robots are designed by machines, like by humans, right? They're not evolved, they're designed by, by us humans. And so what we, what we need are some guidelines, 
try and make sure that these robot designers are building the kinds of robots that are transparent, not robots that are there to deceive us, to trick us into thinking they're smarter than they are, to deceiving us about their capabilities or their intentions, but transparent machines that can help us all in our lives to do all kinds of really useful things, just like all the other technology we use. Now, there are, the UK actually leads in this because we have the principles of robotics and academics and lawyers and different people got together in 2010 and produced this document called the Principle of Robotics, which has set five principles in it for how robot designers should build robots. Um, but they're just guidelines, they don't have any teeth. The IEEE, which is a global standards body, is also producing um, a set of guidelines for AI uh, and autonomous machines. And the, uh, the, the European Parliament is looking at law, there's draft legislation at the moment, it's at a very early stage, to uh, try and produce regulations for how people should build robots. But at the moment, you can buy a robot and it's completely unregulated. There are no rules or regulations at the moment about these autonomous machines, which I think is a real concern, um, which is why I'm here today to tell you about that. And just to start your thinking about what kind of robots do you want to see in the future? Do you want to see militarized robots, autonomous machines fighting in wars? Do you want to see robots caring for old people, providing companionship in care homes for old people? Do you want to see robots in shops and offices? What do you want? People need to think about what kind of robots they want, and we all need to make sure that we get the robots that we want, and not necessarily the robots that are easy to make, cheap to build, and can manipulate us possibly to our detriment. Thank you very much.